the Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 656. No, wait, I got that wrong. Episode, I got it backwards, 656 for Sunday, May 7th, 2017. <laughs> folks and welcome to the mac observers mac geek gab the show where you send in your questions your tips your cool stuff found we share it all we answer it all the goal is that every single one of us every single last person listening to this show the person doing this show that person over there us you all of us we're gonna learn at least four new things between now and and when we stop recording a little bit later, that's the goal. Sponsors for this episode include Smile uh, at smilesoftware.com slash geek with PDF Pen 9 and Bitbucket from Atlassian with their For the Code promotion. You can get a free Git repository at bitbucket.com slash For the Code. We will talk all about both of those in a moment here, here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in pollen-laden Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's pollen-laden New England today is what it is. We, you and I are basically neighbors in, in, uh, in that today. When trees attack. When, when trees attack. attack. <laughs> yeah, man. God, it's like poison outside. <laughs> Fun stuff, though. It's uh, it, I actually, when I lived in Austin, I really missed the change of season down there um you know you ba we basically had like a week of spring and a week of fall and and then it was either summer or not summer and uh and, and so I, I i do like the change of season just some of the effects of it you know <laughs> now in texas they don't really have because one time I, I took a fall picture and one yeah. of my online friends in texas oh, said yeah. what what are those i'm like well those are the trees leaves changing Right. Like, wow, that's that's interesting. Yeah, no, you, you. That's why people come to New England in the fall for leaf peeping season. So they just drive around and look at I mean, the, what happens the beautiful to the, leaves in Texas. Do they just fall off the trees? Or? Um, no, they they just or continually. They don't, change. they don't change. It doesn't. No, okay. Yeah, it's just it doesn't. That's not what happens there. I mean, they change sometimes, but not not at all like the splendor that we get here. It, mm -hmm. It's yeah. Yeah. Anyway, hey, uh, some quick tips. Let's let's do some of these and get into this gary says i just wanted to give a quick tip for those who like to have siri talk in an accent from another country such as uk english like me if you ask siri when a holiday note uh when a holiday is if that holiday is celebrated on a different day in said country it will give that country's date for the holiday for example, if you ask Siri what day Mother's Day is and you have it set to UK English, it will say Mother's Day is March 11th, 2018. If you had a Russian accent, if available and asked for Christmas, it would likely say that Christmas is January 7th, 2018. Good call, Gary. That's right. Some, many of the holidays between US and UK uh, are the same, but not all of them. So, yeah, beware of that if you... Uh, choose to use a foreign accent for Siri. I like that tip, man. Good stuff. Moving on to Chris. Chris says, uh, I recently heard you talking about one of the caveats of resetting network settings on your phone is that you then have to reconfigure all your VPNs. I feel your pain on that issue. I've been having trouble getting my iPhone to remember my works Wi-Fi network. I knew that I should reset the network settings since I'm the only one having the problem. I also knew that, unfortunately, it would remove all of my VPN settings, and I have six of them because of my consultation side business. And all of them are L2TP with a password and a pre-shared key, and all of those are randomly generated strings. Very painful to have to reconfigure them, but, he says, I remember hearing the esteemed Mr. John F. Braun mention the Apple configurator and its ability to create profiles. I knew that profiles could contain VPN configuration, so tonight I gave it a go, and it worked perfectly. I was able to create a profile in Configurator 2 that contains all of my VPN settings. I reset my network settings and then airdropped the profile to my phone. Bingo. All my VPN configurations are installed automatically. 
that is pretty cool, man. I like it. It's good stuff. Did you ever um, install one to prevent you from joining that cursed? <laughs> no, I, I didn't. The, lo- the Logan Wi-Fi network. No, I think I finally got that. I purged that from my from my devices. <laughs> okay. But um, but I did as soon as he as soon as I, I read Chris's note, I thought, what a great idea. So I built one for the L2TP VPN that I have here at my house and then also the one that I have at my dad's house. So it's now that's sitting in my uh, in my cloud station drive and I can get to it from from anywhere. So, yeah, it's good stuff. I like it. It's fun. All right. Uh, and it works really, really well. It, it um, there's some, there's it's worth it's totally worth playing with Apple Configurator, too, um, especially since it's free. Right. It is free. Right? It's got to be. Moving on to John, John uh, writes, he, uh, he said, you know, we were talking a lot about uh, mounting shares and keeping them auto mounted and all of that stuff. And he sent us a link to a blog post on uh, grapii.com. I don't even know how to pronounce that, but it's a blog post all about keeping network drives mounted on Mac OS using auto FS, which the beauty is. It's built in to Mac OS, so you don't need any third party software to do it. And of course, that means it's free. The downside is you have to configure 100 percent of it from the terminal. But uh, but this article does a speller, a stellar speller. It's either a splendid or a stellar job. So it must be a speller job of uh, of of, you know, explaining all of this. So we will put a link to all of that in the show notes. Because uh, because that's what we do. Thoughts on that, John? I never really thought of that. Yeah, it's pretty good. Give it a whirl. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, kind of sounds like launch D, but for your file system. Right, right. Yeah, you're you're editing. Yeah, it's the auto FS stuff. Yeah, and it doesn't look I, when you look at it on the surface, it looks a little uh, a little fishy, but it, not fishy. It looks a little convoluted. Uh, but it's really not all that convoluted. It's pretty straightforward. So, and if you go through this, you will, by the end of it, you will have a, an even better understanding of just sort of how things work underneath all of OS, Mac OS 10, Mac OS well, I remember for, OS 10. for a while, I finally ended up finding this file, this configuration file that they have because, yep. um, and I still see these in here. Uh, I noticed this one day when I was running hardware growler, which uh, among other things yeah. will show if you're mounting or unmounting disc images, which is actually Handy. The, the one useful thing about it is that there are, well, I don't think they do it anymore, but there are some things that kind of sneakily update themselves without telling you. But, sure. Um, hardware growler. I would see it be like, Oh yeah. You know, uh, Chrome is, is updating itself. Um, if, if you didn't have that, you wouldn't know. But then the other thing I noticed is that I see these slash net and slash home directories. And I was always wondering, Who's doing that? And the thing is, it's this file is is doing that. I'm not sure if you need those anymore. Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. But it bugged me because I'm like, somebody is mounting these these volumes and I have to find out who. So uh, good stuff. Yeah, pretty good. And then uh, last in our quick tips here, Chuck says, uh, almost too minor to mention. He says, but... Uh, I found this and categorized it in the usefulness department. He says, it's good to pay attention to the dots that appear on the screens of various iPhone apps. He says, I've been using the digital stopwatch screen of the iPhone's clock app for years. It's large font readout is easy to see from a distance, but I never noticed until today that there is a second screen that is a combination of analog and digital, which is also very useful and even a bit nostalgic. Um, And this screen looks a lot like the analog stopwatch uh, available on the Apple Watch. He said the functionality of some apps is perhaps a bit too subtle at times. And he's right. Between the reset and start buttons on the stopwatch on your iPhone, you'll see two dots. And the left one is lit up and the right one is not. And if you swipe the screen to the left, you will get the screen that's on the right, which is the digital stopwatch. So Chuck's advice, follow the dots. Because that's, uh, hey, you might find something you didn't know was there. Pretty good. Follow the dots, John. Works for Pac-Man. 
It does work for Pac-Man. That's right. Stay away from the ghosts. I ain't afraid of no ghost. All right. On to cool stuff found. One thing, though, if you want to, uh, if, if you want to make sure you stay away from ghosts is you want to stay awake. And sometimes your Mac doesn't want to stay awake. <clears throat> and that's, uh, that's where amphetamine comes in. Amphetamine is a graphical interface, interface, interface for the terminal command called caffeinate, which is built into your Mac. And caffeinate will keep your Mac awake. And amphetamine gives you a really nice interface for this that that has some configuration options and uh, and all of that stuff. And it's available in the Mac App Store. So we will put a link to that in the show notes. Very, very cool thing. Did you check this out? Did you download am- amphetamine, John? I played with caffeine at one point. But... Well, yeah, but so here's the um, here's the beauty of amphetamine. Caffeine I, I and I sorry, not caffeine, caffeinate. Um, I use regularly if I'm ripping movies uh, because a lot of times my machine, especially if I'm uh, logged in remotely, will then go to sleep as soon as I I log out and leave it to its own devices to convert these movies. So I use caffeinate from the terminal all the time. One cool thing, uh, or actually several cool things about uh, amphetamine is that even though it uses caffeinate to do the, <clears throat> the keeping awake of the Mac, <clears throat> it's got all sets of all, all sorts of schedules and triggers options to send notifications, all of that stuff. So it kind of enhances the whole experience and it's free. So pretty good stuff. No. Yes. Now, why wouldn't, I mean, the thing is, as people probably know, but you can set the sleep in energy saver. You can set when the computer sleeps. Why would just setting computer sleep to never not be a... a well, you might, my, my issue with that is I forget and I leave it on that. And then it's that okay. way for weeks until I notice. And I'm like, hey, it hasn't gone to sleep. Oh, crap. So that's why I like to use caffeinate to just do it for a short period of time. And okay. then, and then it, and then it, you know, that's it. So yeah, it's pretty good stuff. I like it. Yeah. So that's why. And that's okay. really the only reason. Yeah. Okay. Um, in the, uh, department of desk connect, uh, replacements, because that has now gone away. Steve offers another one, another contender called Instashare at instashareapp.com. And, uh, this is a mobile and desktop suite of applications, iOS, Mac, Android, windows, and you can beam stuff around to your devices very, very easily. Um, basically whatever you want. So, Pretty cool stuff. So we'll put that in the cool stuff found list for today too. Good stuff, John. Yeah. I like sharing. Sharing is good. Sharing is good. Yeah. All right. And then, uh, and then Charles brings us some network geekiness in, uh, in cool stuff found. He says, you mentioned ping plotter in show six fifty one but really didn't give it the attention it deserves. He says, I used this app years ago on the PC and was excited when they finally rewrote and released it last year for the Mac. What ping plotter does is a trace route to the destination IP address that you choose. Then it pings every hop along that path. I usually change the default interval to every one second. He says, I think the default is every one and a half. It also continually does a trace route so that if the path through the layer three network changes, it notifies you. You also get the historical information about latency, packet loss, and jitter in an ex- excellent graphical format, which you can adjust and scroll through in the range. This is a great tro- tool for troubleshooting where and when a network problem happens, as the network is always blamed first, especially if the problem is at random times. So this is one of those things where uh, if you, it, it, the idea would be to keep it running over a long period of time. And then when you notice a problem has happened, you can look at this and say, Hey, wait a minute, you know, my route to that host changed. Why? And, and you might be able to kind of dig in a little deeper. So thank you for that. Charles, he says, you also had mentioned about scanning a network to see what hosts are alive. As you mentioned, yes, you can do a broadcast ping, pinging the broadcast IP V4 address, which is typically the dot two five five address and see who responds. 
Not all device manufacturers write that into their network stack, though, so it doesn't always work. What I have used for years is a piece of software called Angry IP Scanner. It can be configured for a number of different types of pings, including TCP and UDP, to determine if a system is alive. It can also do some scans of the host ports to see if a host is really alive and just not responding to pings. Hope this helps. Thank you very much, Charles. Very, very good stuff, man. I like this angry IP scanner. Have you, uh, have you used that before? Um, I think I have it kicking around somewhere. I typically use, uh, I like thing. Oh for, yeah. Uh, okay. Finding out what's, uh, yep. Is that from the same, the same crew? I'm not sure. Uh, no, I don't, I think thing is a different, um, different group of people that make it all together, but I will, I will put thing in the, uh, in the show notes, do you use Fing on your iPhone or on your Mac or both? Uh, I don't think it's on the Mac. I think it's just on the on the phone. Oh, is that right? I could have sworn Fing was on the Mac, but I I could easily be. No, I have Angry that. IP Scanner on the Mac. Yeah, okay. Here, if I angry, yeah, there we go. Angry IP Scanner. All right. Yeah. Well, that's how yeah. it goes. Yeah, I haven't needed to use it for a while. And then Fing, they're coming out with some sort of intrusion detection network monitoring Fing box, I think they call Fing it. Fing box, yeah, yeah. We saw that um, at CES, didn't we? I don't know if I saw it. Did I? I, I Maybe did. you saw it. I, had, okay. I spoke with them quite a bit about it, yeah. Okay. Well, I think it was a work in progress. I don't, I don't know if it's a released product yet. I don't think it's out yet. No, that's right. Yeah. So... And I'm seeing somebody uh, in the chat room, actually someone that's helping us craft our show notes here, says that, yes, Fing for Mac exists as well. So we've got a link for all of that in the show notes. Thank you. I'm going to I'm going to take a random guess and say that that was Brian Monroe from our chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. But I can't tell. So thank you to whomever it was. You are awesome. All right. And then the last entry in Cool Stuff Found, John, comes from listener William. And listener William says, uh, I haven't used the Ear Buddies, which you mentioned in the last show, but are currently unavailable on Amazon. But I can vouch for something else called Ear Hooks from a company called Spigen, S-P-I-G-E-N. And Ear Hooks is with an S. He says they slip onto AirPods quite easily and include cutouts for all of the sensors. So tapping for Siri or play pause works flawlessly. Really a superior design. Um, he says, I may be weird, but I actually only need the left one. My right one never slips out of my ear. So he gave us a link for those as well. <laughs> very, very cool stuff. I like, um, I like it when all of this just comes together and, uh, you know, that's how we do it. Right. Any thoughts on that, John? Like the A team. I love it when a plan comes together. Like the A team. Are you, uh, are you BA? <laughs> I'm not Mr. T. No. I no. I don't know who I'd who I'd be. Okay. Well, I think I think we obviously need to just stop the show and, and figure that out right now, don't we? No. We should just no. keep moving along. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, those little hooks. I, I like the idea of those little hooks. I gotta try them on ear pods because those have always fallen out of my ears. But I am I am very much uh an in ear fully sealed type of person when it comes to using in-ear stuff and um and i guess that's no surprise having been a musician for years and using that stuff on stage but even when we podcast here i really like having something totally seal me off from the world and i don't like something pressing on the outside of my head for that long so uh so i always have used in-ears and actually right now i'm using uh jh audio which was founded by jerry harvey from uh, uh that's the jh and jh audio but he was the original founder of ultimate ears years ago i've got a set of the jh audio laylas which are their reference monitor um quality in ears and they are stellar for podcasting with because they really give me a flat response and i know what you folks are hearing and all that good stuff so i like it it's good uh, i'll put a link to those in the show notes if anybody cares and anybody wants to look it up. All right. John, shall we uh shall we go on, my friend? Where are we? Where are we? You know what I want to do? I want to take a minute and talk about our two sponsors. Does that work for you, my friend? 
Of course. Oh, awesome. You rock. Our first sponsor is Smile, and PDF Pen 9 is what we're talking about uh, this month here. PDF Pen 9 just came out uh, in April, and you can find all about it at smilesoftware.com slash geek. The new PDF Pen 9 really, well, PDF Pen in general is, one again, one of those tools I just can't live without. And Smile has a habit of creating and, and releasing tools just like this. PDF pen allows you allows me to manipulate PDFs in ways that just aren't possible with the, the free stuff built in to Mac OS. I can not only can I do things like moving pages around, but I can um, find and highlight all instances of a word or phrase. I can add or remove OCR text layers. I can create links to other PDF files. I can export a PDF in grayscale and also to JPEG, PNG, one bit TIFF. If you really want to like crunch down a PDF, this is what PDF pen and especially PDF pen nine can do for you. I can use forms, which do calculations, really, really cool stuff. PDF pen pro nine adds the ability or enhances the ability to do table of contents, editing with links to all of your other pages and adds OCR for Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which is pretty darn cool. Um, it, you know, I, and, and then it can still do all of what I'll call the simple stuff. Adding your signature to a PDF, converting a Word document into a PDF. All of these things that you just find yourself needing to do. And having PDF pen on your Mac or on your iPhone at all times, just at the ready makes life way easier. I can't recommend it enough. So check it out. Go to smilesoftware.com slash geek. Check out PDF Pen 9 and our thanks to Smile for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor for today is Bitbucket at bitbucket.org slash for the code. That's F-O-R-T-H-E-C-O-D-E. Bitbucket is the Git solution for Storing all of your code changes. This is the way to do it if you're working on any sort of code, whether or not you're even working with others. I know people say you don't need a code repository if you're working on your own. Hogwash. For me, the biggest enemy to me when I'm coding is me six months ago, right? Because I don't remember what I did or why I did it or even when I did it. And sometimes even just that temporal reference of seeing when did I make this change? Oh, I made it back then. Right. This is what was going on. Then I can look at my calendar, pull all that stuff together. But of course, Bitbucket allows you to do a lot more than that. You can leave notes in the repository along with the changes that you commit so that you don't even have to check your calendar. You can just see why these changes were made and what was going on because you get to leave yourself notes. And then, of course, if you are working in a group, which most of us wind up doing at some point or another, well, now you can see everybody's notes and everyone can see yours. Bitbucket gives teams of all sizes free private repositories with state of the art features like their fantastic pull request algorithm built-in continuous delivery, and this is where it gets awesome, integrations with all of your favorite tools like Docker, AWS, Azure, all of those things are there, including, of course, because also made by Atlassian is Jira. So you can track all your bugs and issues and feature requests in Jira and link them to Bitbucket. So go ahead, check it out. Bitbucket.org slash for the code, F-O-R-T-H-E-C-O-D-E to start your free account today. Our thanks to Bitbucket for sponsoring this episode. All right, moving right along. Where shall we go here? You want to go to, uh, let's go to Andrew, shall we? Andrew's good stuff. Right, Mr. Miron? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Andrew asks, he says, with the recent influx of Mac malware, there are numerous apps to aid you in combating malware, adware, and other virus type of threats. Is there such a thing as having too many apps running which do similar tasks, e.g. Bitdefender, ClamAV, MacScan, McAfee, and Malwarebytes? Number two, 
Do you folks have a preferred combination of these to assist in protecting your machine from threats? Now, with that being asked, he says, I realize that the best advice is to be a vigilant computer slash mobile device user, as that goes a lot further than any application to help you. As they say, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure today. That ratio may be a little off, though, he says. Well, Andrew, um, I recently started using malware bytes on my machines and actually have had it find some fairly low, uh, low risk threats, but it finds them nonetheless. And then someone in our Mac Geekab group on Facebook. So if you go to MacGeekab.com slash Facebook, you can come to our support group there where uh, somebody actually posted a keyboard maestro macro that will go and run malware bytes for you in the background, uh, you know, in order to uh, to do all that. So automatically. What do you use, John? I use that. And then something that I notice is... Um Every now and then, Drive Genius will give me a little notification saying, hey, yeah, I upgraded my uh, malware database. Huh. There you so, go. Um, so either one of those, but um, typically, yeah, I'll run a... And I got bit one time, too. I was downloading... It was some sort of media handler, and it, it was kind of sketchy. And once I installed it, I realized I made a horrible mistake, and I sure. ran malware bytes, and it's like, yep, huh. you got some malware. Let's, let's clean that up for you, dum-dum. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's good. That's good. Yeah, Malwarebytes seems to be the best one, I think. Um, you know? So, I don't know. I, I, anybody, I'm looking to see if anybody in the chat room says uh, says otherwise, but I don't think so. I think it's I think it's Malwarebytes and Malwarebytes and Malwarebytes. <laughs> I mean, between that and, uh, you know, Apple's underneath the covers uh x protect i think is what they uh yeah they call that that's that's of course another right another tool that silently you know well if you try to mount something that is bad it, it'll just refuse it'll just <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly i had that happen too. one of those bogus uh flash installers yep yeah it's funny when you go to certain sites that they seem to really want you to install uh, to update your flash it's like uh yeah right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The thing is, I know that they're pulling my leg because I de I uninstalled Flash on my desktop machines. Right, right. <laughs> on right. both my machines here. Right. At first, I thought Jeff, our, our own Jeff Gamut, was was a raving lunatic saying that uh, you know you should remove Flash, but uh, he finally convinced me. Yeah, you know, I I leave it installed because there are things for which I still need it occasionally. But as I have mentioned on this show, and I think as Brian Chaffin wrote up for us at at TMO, what I do is I go into, in Safari, I go to security plugin settings. And then for flash, I set uh, at the bottom of that screen. It says when visiting other websites, set that to off, not ask, because if it is set to ask or on your browser will announce to those websites that it has flash installed. So if you set it to ask, what will happen is the website will just kind of pause and ask your browser will be asking you if you want to run flash. If you set it to off, your browser does not advertise that you have flash installed. So if a website has, say, an HTML5 workaround for you not having, excuse me, not having flash, then that just kicks in and you don't even know that they would have used flash if you had it. That way. Websites just act like they would for you, John, without having Flash installed at all, because it's as though you don't have it. The only websites that see that I have Flash are the ones that above that in the window I have chosen and selected on. And that works really well for me. So I, I highly recommend that if you run ever run into anything where you need to run Flash, it just makes life a little easier. So that's my advice. That's all I got. It's summertime, John, or it will be soon, you know, and that's when these allergies will be over. Our heads will be a little clearer and maybe just maybe we'll start taking some travel. Fred asks a bunch of questions about summer travel. So I will read his questions and then we will talk through them. He says, number one, what is the best way to save pictures just in case customs want to keep wants to keep my iPhone or it gets stolen? I have about four gigs of storage on iCloud and access to Amazon Prime. I would want to back up the photos during the trip. I was thinking about setting up a flash drive for the iPhone. 
When I could get access to Wi-Fi, then I could back up the photos to the cloud. My long range plan would be setting up a Synology cloud at home. Um, and I'm going to read through his questions and then we'll, we'll come back. Uh, he says, uh, I understand that I may need to purchase a SIM card to use in the iPhone uh, to use my iPhone in the UK. Buying one at the airport is the best way to go. If I want to make any calls back to the U S or is buying one at the airport, the best way to go. He asks, uh, let's see. Number three, I will go to the Apple store and purchase the world travel kit. The iPhone seven plus is very new and I want to protect my newest member in the family. We'll talk a little bit about that. He says, what about battery packs? Do you have any recommendations? Uh, he says, my flight from the U S to the UK is about nine hours. And he then lastly, he says, I would like to take my iPad, but with Homeland security may block iPads in the cabins of planes this summer returning from Europe. So I may, I may be traveling without it. All right. So the best let, let's go, let's do these in reverse here. Uh, because the pictures one uh, might take the longest, uh, in terms of discussion. So in terms of your iPad, I would actually bring both your iPhone and iPad um, my family, there are two members of my family recently flew to, to and from China and on the way to China, they were allowed to use tablets in the cabin, but not phones. Phones couldn't even be in airplane mode. They had to be off and stowed away. So you could not use your phone at all, but you could use a tablet. And of course, my son texted me from his, his iPad and said, I don't get it because my iPad has a, a 3G or a 4G, you know, chip in it. So what's the difference? And, like, yeah, don't tell them that, kiddo, you know. <laughs> so I, I would bring both, especially for a long flight. And I would prepare both of them with whatever movies or whatever you want. This is going to be a moving target for a while, which uh, devices are allowed use in the cabin, especially on, on international flights. So just be prepared for anything would be would be my advice. Any thoughts on that, John, before we before we move on? Nope. Okay. Uh in terms of the world travel kit, um, if all you're bringing with you is Macs and or iOS devices, um, you can probably save a ton of money. I went when we went to Europe last year and I did the same thing for uh, Lisa and Lucas when they went to China recently. I just went to ricksteves.com, R-I-C-K-S-T-E-V-E-S, and bought adapters. Your power... Um, your power bricks, for lack of a better term, for your Mac and your iPhone will support all the voltages available throughout the world. So you don't need a power converter. You just need an adapter so you can take what you have and plug it into their plugs. And um, at Rick Steves, those adapters were all literally one dollar. So I bought, you know, I, when we went to Europe, so we were in the UK and then and then the rest of Europe. So I had to buy two two sets of adapters, but that was, you know, eight bucks to buy one for each of the four of us. And then we have our, you know, power bricks or whatever, and everything worked fine. So you, you don't need converters. You don't need anything overly special. Your power brick from your iPhone will protect your iPhone 7. That That is what it is built to do. You just need to get it plugged into the, uh, to the plug. And actually in China, they found most of the time uh, U.S. plugs were taken, were, were, were accepted because China and Australia use the same thing, just as long as it's not a polarized plug, you were fine. They were fine in China, so it's interesting stuff. Thoughts on that, my friend? I haven't had to do that for a while, but yeah, I, I got the world adapter kit. You did, huh? Last yeah. needed to, uh, yeah. And I remember they actually had a recall. It was like <laughs> seven years later. They were like, "Oh yeah, by the way, there was a defect in that kit you uh, purchased from us." Like. Oh. <laughs> ages ago and they actually swapped out a couple because yep. there was the uh, potential for them to uh, burst into flames or something. Yeah, like right, 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 right. Yeah, I just don't think you need to spend that kind of money. Uh, I don't think it's going to do anything for you. So, um, all right, moving up the chain here. In terms of purchasing a SIM card, uh, our experience has been that it's really difficult to purchase a SIM card for another country from the U S if you don't live in that other country. So if you live in the U S and more specifically, your credit card has a U.S. based billing address, then you are going to have a really hard time buying a SIM card and, or buying even top ups type service, you know, a month's worth of data or whatever, before you go that said, we did it. Uh, several Mac Keycap listeners, Mike in particular, helped out a ton in terms of getting us SIM cards before we went to Europe. 
Then we had to go through this process of adding data to them. That was, I was able to get data on two of the four of them that we got. And then even that path got shut off because it was kind of a shady path because this, this, this company was selling us data that probably shouldn't have been. And finally it was like, you know, let's just deal with it. When we get to the airport, the data we bought for the other two SIM cards was cheaper and more data that, you know, than what we were able to buy remotely here in the U S it's just go get off the plane, go through immigration, go through customs. And before you get in a, an Uber or whatever, um, or a cab or what, you know, however it is, you're going to get to where you're going, just go and, and buy a SIM and some, some data right there in the airport. It's, that's going to be your best bet. So there you go. That's my advice. Oh, and if you are going to use Uber, re you have to reconfigure Uber after you put your new SIM in because Uber's got to confirm the new phone number that you have. When you swap out SIMs in a foreign country, you get a new phone number. So bear that in mind. Just because otherwise you might have a problem. And then, of course, the trick is remember to do that when you get back. And don't lose your SIM. When you take that SIM out of your iPhone... Have a spot in your travel case or something that you put it because you're not going to think about it for two weeks and you're going to have like or however long you're there and you're going to have these, you know, grandiose experiences every day. And then suddenly, you know, whatever, a week, two weeks later, you're back on the airplane. You're like, where did I put that SIM for my iPhone? And, you know, those aren't large things, so they get lost pretty easily. So think about that ahead of time. Put it in one spot and then it'll be there when you're uh, when you're going back. Okay. Um, so that's the SIM card thing. All right. So this photos thing, John, this is where I really want to dig in with you. How to back up pictures remotely. So he doesn't want to bring up, it sounds like he doesn't want to bring a Mac with him. And I totally get that. So how does he back up pictures from his iPhone to something he has with him when he can't necessarily get things backed up to the cloud? That's the, that's the question I pose to you. What do you think? Um, I'll tell you what I think. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of devices that'll uh, that'll handle this for you, Dave. Sweet. <clears throat> um, probably my favorite, and it actually uh, prompts you for this. But um, there's the iExpand um, case for the iPhone. What is this? this is a SanDisk product. Um, yep. But basically it's a case, has a lightning connector. When you plug your phone in, um, they have a little piece of software you can run. Okay. And it'll say, hey, you want me to, uh, you know, back up your photos? And when it's done, it'll actually prompt you. And I think you can turn this off if you want. But it'll say, hey, you want me to scrub those off of your, uh, off your phone while I'm at it? So if you want to make sure that they're not on your phone and they're on this, you know, on this memory case, um, that's one way to do it. Huh. They actually have several products that, uh, yeah. I mean, if we look at, uh, that's the one that comes to mind here. Also that has a, uh, uh, the I expand memory case actually has a battery option as well, which is kind of slick. So it, it does a number of things for you. I really like it. Um, cool. And that's just, uh, a, they call that the I expand mobile flash drive. Is that right? No, it's the I expand. Yeah, let's find it. I think it's the iExpand memory case. Okay. All right. I'm trying to find it on there. And they have a few others here, too. Yeah, they have several memory products here. So they have the iExpand flash drive for iPhone and iPad. That's another one. Um, the sizes go up, I think, up to 256 gigs. So, uh, yeah, you'll pay for it. What else do we sure. have here? Connect wireless stick. That's another nice one. So um, I think that'll, lead, that'll let you uh, beam them. I think you can beam them to the oh, place. You can, yeah, you can yeah, certainly yeah. download them. So, um, several things from, uh, from them, from Sandus that I would recommend for, uh, backing up your photos. Yeah. I like it. Cool. Um, my, some of my thoughts on this include the meme. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a, a charging cable actually that has a, storage uh you know it's got some flash storage right in the cable and it has a companion app and it's built to back up your photos and things like that contacts calendar messages music photos and videos and uh and we talked about this on the on the show once before but uh, i will 
I will put a link to it in the show notes because it's, it could be your charging cable and your backup device the whole time that you are gone. So I will put that there because we like cool stuff like that. Previous cool stuff found con contender. And, um, and then, you know, kind of to solve two of the problems is something like the Seagate wireless plus, which is its own little hard drive and hotspot all in one. You could think of it as, as sort of a very purpose built uh, network storage drive in that you can store all your movies on this. So I was thinking about from your, when you, you know, you can't decide whether you're bringing your iPhone or your iPad and which one to put movies on and what, what they're going to let you use on the plane. Uh, it, you could just put the app to stream movies from this device. Now, you are running Wi-Fi on a plane, and I'm going to leave it up to you to decide whether or not that's okay. But uh, but it hasn't brought down any planes I've been on, so let's just put that out there. And you can get it in one terabyte or two terabyte sizes. But not only can you stream from it, you can back up to it. So this thing could be an interesting little uh, device, and I'll put a link in the show notes for you. And of course, you can stream more than one uh device at a uh, stream to more than one device at a time. So if you, even if you're traveling with your family, you could use this wireless plus to stream to several uh, things at once. And they've got, they've got several related products. There's the Seagate wireless plus, And then there is the, um, what do they call it? It's, I guess they just call it the Seagate wireless, uh, which does sort of the same thing. It's, uh, it's called wireless mobile storage. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes too, for, uh, for you okay yeah it sounds similar to the uh one of the sandest things one of the sandest thing. yeah. yeah exactly exactly yep yeah so yeah it's pretty uh pretty cool stuff but yeah there's you know there's options and i and I, I when we went to europe i brought one of these seagate wireless mobile storage devices with me and it worked it, it was fine we didn't really need it because we were all able to back up both to icloud and to our synology cloud that we uh that we have because we always had decent wi-fi in the apartments that we rented but obviously we didn't know that going in so like you we we had a backup plan so it's good it's good traveling with a geek right or having geeks assist you when you travel so all right john you gonna uh you gonna regale us with some information about ios email i think so now you'll notice that in our notebook i uh must have had a uh, slip here, but I have the email in front of me here, Dave. Okay. So I'm going to uh, see if you have any thoughts on this. I, sure. I certainly have a thought. So Sandy writes, I'm having an issue sending email with my iPad and iPhone occasionally. When I find an article online that I like to save, I send it using email to myself. I use the above email address to send from and send it to another Gmail address that I have. Nine times out of ten, when I do this, the emails get put in the outbox with an exclamation mark. Tapping an exclamation mark gives the following error. The connection to the outgoing server, smtp.gmail.com, failed. Additional outgoing mail servers can be configured in settings, mail, contacts, calendars. I've tried deleting Gmail and adding back the two email addresses, which work for a short time and then the same problem. Also, yesterday, I tried to send an email from the above address to someone with an AOL.com email address, and I got this error. The connection to the outgoing server smtp.comcast.net failed. Additional outgoing mail servers, blah, 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 same thing. Um, each time this happens, I'm not on my home Wi-Fi network. In the case of the iPhone, I was using cellular data and had a strong connection. My iPad doesn't have cellular. Any idea why this happens? I think I know why this happens, Dave. <clears throat> at least I hope <laughs> this is why it happens. Um, you may see inconsistent behavior depending on what network you're on when you try to send mail, right? Yeah. So SMTP is the mechanism that you use to send mail. When I've had this problem in the past, Dave, it's typically because I'm not providing the SMTP server with uh, a username and password. I'm not authenticating myself. I can't imagine. I, I can't imagine there's any SMTP servers that don't require username and password, regardless of where you're connecting from now, though. I don't think probably any exist. not. I, yeah. I think, I mean, unless you run one in, yourself. In, yeah. 
Well, in some cases, if the SMTP server thinks that you're on the same network, it may not require authentication. So I think that's why this may work at times and not others. So my suggestion would be to dig into your settings on your uh, machine and make sure that. Yeah, but she's using um, Gmail, which always requires. Um, right. Authentication. So I'm, I'm thinking that data may not be there. You may have to refresh it. Yep. And where you go is you go and you have to dig kind of deep in the mail on iOS. So it's settings, mail, accounts. Then you choose the account. And then there should be an SMTP setting. Yep. And then once you click on that, it'll show you the parameters that are being used to send to that SMTP server. Yeah. And just make sure, because I actually looked on one of my, and, and then you'll also, typically when you go there, you also get a list, or, or when you get this error, you'll also get a list of alternative SMTP servers that you can use. So you may want to set up for that. you get that list on your iPhone? I don't think I you do. I did. No, I know I saw it. Did you? Okay. When, I was, when right. I was digging in, I saw a list and it's like, okay, well, here's the, here's the primary. And by the way, here's all these other ones that I know about. You want to maybe use these? Yeah. So that's the other thing is you, um, whether it's mail on Mac OS or iOS, typically when things don't work out, it says, okay, this isn't working. Try How about B. you choose another one? Yeah. And, and and depending on the, on the OS, um, you do this in different places, but that's a... Uh, yeah, it's, I'm with you that it sounds like uh, she just needs to go and I, I would remove the SMTP servers that are there and just re-add them. That, I mean, that, that would be my advice. Yeah, I mean, let me just dig in here. All right, so I'm going here. So for example, on my iOS device here yep. for, for SMTP, Yep. Okay. It shows the whole whole kit and caboodle here. Okay. So, so let's tell them how we got there. So we go to, to settings, mail, accounts, and then pick one of your accounts. And, and click one of the accounts. And then there should be outgoing mail server SMTP. Nope. Like, so you got to pick, you got to pick the accounts, right? So let, let me get them there from the beginning because you keep skipping a step. So settings, mail, accounts, pick one of your accounts, then click on account. And then there you get to click on outgoing mail server SMTP. And then you get to this list that John's talking about. Yes. Yes. And when I click on that, so for example, on my Yahoo account, it shows SMTP mail, yahoo.com. That, sure. That makes sense. If I then click on that entry, then I get another screen and it says, oh, well, here's the primary server. And if I want to, if I click on it again, it'll then show, okay, well, you know, here's the name of it, username, password. Now that's kind of weird because it's actually, sh oh, no, okay. That's weird. So password, it says optional, but then two lines down, it says, oh, and by the way, you're using password authentication. That's a very confusing dialogue here. You can also set SSL and the server port 587, which I guess is a secure uh, outgoing mail port. But then you also get a list and it says other SMTP servers. And by default, so these are from all the other accounts that you have defined. And by default, they're all off. And I have a huge sure. list here. Yeah, so right. you may want to, for the accounts where you have issues, maybe choose activate one of these backup servers and, and make sure the uh, credentials are correct. Yeah. The, one piece of warning I will give you with activating backup servers is that generally nowadays you are only allowed to send email from an address that that server knows about. So, for example, if you're sending from, you know, or whatever, my email at gmail.com, and for whatever reason, Gmail won't send that mail, if you try to send that through Comcast or, or Yahoo, it may bounce that email saying, whoa, whoa, that's not coming from, you know, my Yahoo address or my Comcast address, so I'm not going to send it. Or... And I haven't tested this, which is why I say or it might change your from address to be from, say, Yahoo or Comcast so that it can send that email out. Just be aware or do some testing uh, to know what these things are going to do so that you're not accidentally sending, say, a work email from your Yahoo account without being aware of the fact that that's happening. Just, you know, because you got to be aware of that. And then in. uh and I'm trying to find the URL for this, but in uh, in the chat room at MacGeekUp.com slash stream, 
Brian Monroe suggests, especially with Gmail, that sometimes your credentials will be bounced if Gmail, in their infinite wisdom, decides you need to reset your CAPTCHA uh, or re-authenticate or reprove that you are a human. And, uh, and there is a URL to do that, and we will put a link in the show notes. Um, you basically, go to accounts.google.com slash display un unlock CAPTCHA, C-A-P-T-C-H-A, but we'll put that in the show notes so that you can see the instructions so that uh, so that you can do that. And I have, it's been a while since I've experienced that, thankfully, but uh, there was a period of time, I think, where I was going through that quite a bit. So, yet more fun. Right, Mr. Braun? Yeah, that's how you define fun. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I got. It, it, um, yeah, I like the captcha angle. I haven't, uh, I didn't realize that some, uh, some email it's, services. I think may, it's yeah. just Gmail, uh, which is why I didn't really think about it for Sandra because she's also having problems with Comcast Mail. So I think your idea about just you know wipe them fresh and and bring them back in is good. But, um, but we shall see. I mean, we had something similar happen. I think it was, yeah, I think you and I both had this when we were supporting our parents is yep. um, if you change your password, sometimes it doesn't propagate to all the different um, things that use it. Yeah. I remember this. Yeah. All of a sudden. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. I think the password, the, there was a, a, a password change for the main password to log into Yahoo and it didn't update it in the keychain. It's like, Huh. I think you had that problem too. All of a sudden my mom's like, I can't send an email. Oh, I get this yeah, error. Yeah, and I'm like, okay. Definitely. So I wrote it in yeah. and I'm like, yeah. oh, well, it's prompting you for the password. Right. Right. It's like, well, it never did that before. It's like, well, it's prompting because the password changed. And yeah. And that, I think you and I both reflected that, well, that's kind of lame. I mean, if you change your password for your, you know, Yahoo or Google or whatever, why doesn't it change it in the keychain? <laughs> Because it's going to have to provide it at some point, right? At some point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Or an iOS as well. Um, so that, that whole activity doesn't seem to be well synchronized with a lot of uh, services. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. You want to take us to, uh, to the next one about iOS email here, John? Oh, boy. We're just uh, it's iOS email party here. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me get this here. Okay. Who, who are we talking here? Well, it's listener David, but you didn't put his name in the... Uh, in the agenda. So oh, okay. it's just, all right. It's but the I one did save the whole thing here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if I really have an answer, but at least I confirmed the uh, behavior here. Sure. So um, I'm not who's sure he's writing to here, but he says, gentlemen, not sure if you covered this before, but it's been eternally frustrating for me. When I flag a message in iOS, I can't see it in the flag mailbox on the phone. This is driving me nuts because I flag messages all the time on Mac OS. Yeah. I can't view them on my phone. If I search for flagged, it kind of sort of works, but I don't get them all. And search has always been sketchy for me. Slow and doesn't always show all the results when I know the mail is there. However, regardless of where I flag an email, it does show up on Mac OS mail app properly in the flagged folder. I've tried re-indexing the mailboxes and other cleanup type tasks and nothing works. And I can't believe this is expected behavior. <laughs> then again, I'm beginning to suspect this is yet another item that isn't synced as part of iCloud. <sighs> I think this is expected behavior, Dave. Yeah, it may not well, be my desired. My response was as followed. Yeah. In that I, uh, my experience, and I, I don't really do much on iOS with flagged stuff, but I, but I decided to, to try it and see how, you know, how it performs between Mac OS sure. and iOS. Sure. So, for example, on currently on Mac OS, I have 25 emails flagged. Um, okay. So the first thing I did is I went into, so if you go out to mail on iOS, um, you will see a screen. So let me bring up that, that screen. Yeah. And you go to your mailboxes and you say edit. You'll then see that you can bring up a flagged mailbox. It's normally unchecked. Okay. So right? we're on the mailboxes list in iOS. So one up from your inbox, if that's where you were, right? Now you're on your mailboxes list and you can add a flagged mailbox. I, I'm with you here. Okay. Yep. So I did that, and then I looked in it, and it says, oh, yeah, there, yeah you got four. I'm like, what? Because I don't have four. I have way more, Dave. <laughs> so that didn't work. So, so I think that behavior is 
wrong. Huh. Okay. Now here's the other thing I tried though, and this uh, and I think he he was suggesting uh, this was being suggested as well. Well, l- let me go to my mailboxes and let's uh, let's do a search. And how do you do that? Well, you can click on all mailboxes. Yeah. And say search, and then it gives you suggestions for things to search for, Dave. And one of them is flagged messages. Yeah. This is getting even more confusing. So there's not only so like is that the same flagged messages as the what I just did? And I don't think it is because when, when I search for flag messages, Dave, I got actually more than 25, <laughs> including some that were, I think, cached from the past. There were some old CES emails that when we were going to CES, I actually flagged them. Yeah. And it still shows them as being flagged on my iPhone when I search for flag, but they're not flagged anymore on, on my Mac OS. So what am I trying to say, Dave? I think what I'm trying to say here, what I'm trying to say here is that so searching for flag messages, I think is going to bring you the most results, but it still doesn't huh. doesn't I, seem to am, synchronize well between uh, I'm not seeing the same things and and I I'm going to add I would, I'm going to add two words to everything you just said. Yeah. For you. Because mm-hmm. I'm not I flag messages sync perfectly for me. Between and I'm and I do it in Gmail, right? They sync perfectly for me back and forth between Mac OS, iOS, and of course my mail server because that's what's storing that data. And searching for them also works flawlessly. Hmm. Yeah. I, I don't. I'm not doubting that that you're having a problem. I'm just saying we need to significantly limit the scope of what you're describing here. Because it is mm-hmm. not for everyone, it is for you. And for our listener. And, and for listener David. No, that's that's <laughs> totally true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So. But the, I guess my question for both you and David and anyone else having this problem is how many email accounts do you have on your Mac versus on your iPhone versus, you know, uh, in, in these other places, because when you start doing a search and you say all mailboxes as opposed to current mailbox, it is looking at everything it can see. Now your iPhone can't see messages that are in the, on my Mac folder on your Mac. Right. So it's possible that if you've got right. some flagged stuff, it's that's, local because yeah. it's stored locally. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, this I'm just I, I just wanted to kind of say it out loud so that we all understand what it is, the scope of what our iPhones can see versus what our Macs can see. And sometimes that's the same if you're not storing any messages locally, if they're all on your IMAP server, then in theory, it can see them all. But it may not see them all initially it, when you start doing a search. Your iPhone first looks for all the mail that's on it, that it has cached, and then it also opens up that search to your mail server by connecting to it over the Internet, assuming it can get a decent connection and blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. So it it, and, and this works. And I just flagged a message in my inbox and it appeared flagged on my Mac and my Mac isn't even running Sierra. It's running El Capitan because. I use hmm. a Tascam USB device and Tascam won't update the drivers and I will shake my fist at them, but that's sort of an aside. Uh, but I did a nice little shake here. And uh, so, you know, it, that it, it just works flawlessly for me. And I'm sure if I go on my Mac and I unflag this message, uh, it will eventually appear unflagged. There it is. Boom. I, I just watched it unflag itself on my uh, on my phone. So. I mean, the only suggestion I have, and it sounds like this was tried on one end, uh, because he says, I've tried re-indexing the mailboxes. Now, yeah. I'm not sure if that was re-indexing on the Mac or, well, there really isn't a re-indexing choice on iOS. Right. Um, the way right. you re-index is you delete it and you add it back again. Actually, that's <laughs> not the way you re-index. It, the, oh. it, it, it seems like it on should iOS? be. If you delete your mailbox... Yeah. And then re- or re- mail account, which is, you know, everything and mm-hmm. then re-add it. Any errors that existed in the cache for that mailbox will still be there. Oh, Sucks. how do you fix that? I, um, thought talk- I thought you talked about that. Yeah. The only way to fix it is to back up your iPhone, oh, wipe no, it and right. restore because the, the caches are not stored as part of that backup. But the other way to fix it, if possible, is to change the name of the mail server you connect to. So for example, if I'm connecting to imap.gmail.com 
and my username is Dave, which it's not, but let's just say, for example, it's Dave at imap.gmail.com. That's what they No, It doesn't matter what I've named the mail account. It could just be Dave's Gmail or whatever. It doesn't matter that the name I apply to it is not what the cash is based on. The cash is based on Dave at imap.gmail.com. But with Gmail, you can connect using a different set of addresses. So if you change or if I were to change my email instead of being Dave at imap.gmail.com, if I changed my incoming mail server to imap.googlemail.com, uh, that actually connects to the same place at Google. But because the name is different, the cache is different as well. So that is a workaround for quickly bypassing the cache uh, on your iPhone. And I don't know how long that cache sticks around. It seems to last kind of, you know, FFE forever. But, um, I, you know, yeah, it sucks. Yeah. So one thing to try may be to do a backup and restore. Yeah. Is... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That wouldn't be a bad idea, actually. Yeah. I mean, it's you're going to wind up with some problems if you do that. But <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it's I hate when the solution is turn it off then on again. Well, and, and that's sort of my issue <laughs> with with troubleshooting on iOS is, you know, we know, for example, right here, we know exactly what the problem is. And if it was on our Macs, what we would do is we would dig in, we would go to home, library, mail, and then we would just delete the folder that matches Dave at imap.gmail.com, right? We know that that's where the problem is. We just take it, we throw it away and we're done. But we can't do that on iOS. And that's, and not at like Apple can't even do that. At least not at the genius bar support level. So that's where it gets really frustrating for me is we know what the solution is, but we're not allowed to touch it. And because we're not allowed to touch it, we have to use these, you know, very, uh, you know, shotgun style approaches that have so many other impacts that we probably can't even guess. But uh, but we can't go in with a, you know, the surgical knife and, and scalpel and do it. So that's my rant for today. But mm -hmm. but it's I think it's a good, good one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. OK, well, that's how we do it. All right, John, you want to uh, you want to take us to Rick? Rick has a great one. All right. Which took an unexpected twist and turn. <laughs> so Rick says, hi, guys. My daughter's hard drive on her MacBook crashed a while back. I'm pretty impressed that she replaced it herself. Now she's having a problem. She has an external hard drive where she keeps her iTunes library. When she tries to access it, she gets this message. The iTunes library.itl file is locked on a locked disk where you do not have write permissions for this file. She tried to use the terminal to change the permissions. Once again, I'm impressed that she got this far. But it tells awesome. her this. chmod. Unable to change file mode on slash volume slash Toshiba space ext. Read only file system. Any idea what she could try? So first, it brought a tear to my eye that, that as I think any any father, is that your 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 kid can change the hard drive themselves. That's that's good. Oh yeah. It brought a tear to my eye. I, I, I still am quite proud that my daughter was, uh, was oh, yeah. not She's only able but but interested and eager to help me swap out all those drives when we did the great SSD experiment a couple of years ago. And now she's like totally comfortable. She's like, yeah, let's just rip it apart. Let's just do it, you know. And she even she got up. She put a virus on her computer not that long ago. Um, nice. And then and then you know told me about it because she wanted to download some movie that we, you know wasn't even available for purchase. So she, like her father, she's like, I'll find it somewhere. Well, we like we, she couldn't buy it. It wasn't even an option. And she's mm -hmm. like, yeah, I think I put a virus on my computer. I'm like, oh, what'd you do? And she did one of those flash installers, like. You know, like you talked about, like, all right, we'll yeah. get rid of it. And I think I was doing something similar. So I, yeah. I, found, I, I was looking for something. Actually, it was something that my TiVo screwed up. My old TiVo didn't right, record right. properly because there was, and I'm like, no, well, you know, I should be able to find this, you know, S whatever, E whatever of the show. And yeah, everybody was getting in my face saying, hey, you better update your flash player. It was like, no, I, no, no, no. <laughs> all right. I'm still Good there. Stuff. I'm still here. Of course I'm still here. Yeah. All right. So, um. I'm going to, I would suggest the path other than the terminal. And the, if you highlight a drive, Dave, um, an external drive, and you do a get info on it from the finder, you're going to see a whole bunch of interesting information. Um, 
And towards the bottom, you're going to see the various permissions, the users and the permissions that they have. But you're also going to see a little checkbox saying, ignore ownership on this volume. Sometimes it's useful to do that. So I'm like, hmm, maybe I want to give that a try. Well, so that, start- will that also ignore um, access control lists on that volume, ACLs? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. But I thought it was, wor- it was worth a try. Uh, it totally is. I, and I think it does ignore ACLs when you do that. ACLs are we sometimes called extended attributes or extended permissions and can really get in your way when you're having a, a what appears to be a permissions problem with a drive and you go and set everything like you know you're supposed to. And it still won't let you do it. A lot of times it's these extended attributes getting in your way, the immutable flag or something a little more hidden. And you've got to get rid of those things. So we'll, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get there. We'll help you, but I'll let you, yeah, you, you go. All right. Yeah. So suggesting that she go to the finder window, which gives you, you know, all the information in, in one place kind of led us down the right path because he said he asked her about that, and she tried that, and apparently it didn't solve the problem. But then here's the, the from left field. Um, he then found out that, oh, by the way, that drive is formatted as NTFS. Oh. 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 Yeah, that's a different so, problem. So I was given yes. So that's a different problem. Now, uh, NTFS, for those that are not in the know, but NTFS is a Windows formatting scheme and the thing is last i checked dave is that the mac can see ntfs volumes but they're read only they, that is, is correct we were, yeah is what we were experiencing here exactly so there are a number of ways you could deal with this so one there are third-party products a lot of them got to throw down some coin but i did find an open source one uh from tuxera.com and, and you see that i have the uh, link there okay um, Tuxera.com has something called open source NTFS 3G. You may want to try that. Um, and who are the other guys that make all the NTFS? Pa- stuff? Pa- oh, I had it. It was on the tip of my tongue and now I've lost it. Paragon. Paragon also makes it though. I don't think they have a free option. No, so, um, but there's yeah, but from what I the- hear, theirs is quite a bit faster than this yes. NTFS, NTFS yes. 3G, but. Still. Yeah. So if you if you're doing a lot of uh, now, now for this purpose, I think performance yeah, is not going to be an issue. Probably. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And I think they have a pay one. Yeah. So either a Paragon or Tuxera are two companies that make uh, NTFS products. Here's another way to solve the problem: ditch the NTFS and maybe uh, maybe reformat the drive. Of course, you know, save the content somewhere else first. How about that's reformatting true. it as either fat or EX fat, depending on the size of the drive. So fat is another way you can format a Windows volume. Um, and last I checked, Mac can read and write from that. No problem. That's true. You could fix this problem even just with your Mac, as long as you have a, another drive somewhere, because your Mac can read NTFS. So you could just read all this NTF- NTFS content off, you know, even with carbon copy cloner to another drive and you're good to go. Yeah, the thing is, a lot, a lot of um, yeah. So, so that's what I would do. Um, though, if you want to fiddle with the NTFS driver, that's that's fine. But I think a better solution would be to just you know ditch the NTFS unless right. you have a good reason for maintaining an NTFS volume. Which, if you're just storing your iTunes on it, then I don't think that's a good enough reason to use NTFS. Right. Right. <laughs> so, and what was the final thing here? Is that the um. Yeah, so it's interesting is that there are two versions of FAT. So FAT is for drives that are less than 30, 32 gigs. And there's something called EX FAT, which I guess is expanded FAT, FAT being file allocation table. And that's for drives that are greater than 32 gigabytes. That's just a little caveat there. Uh, okay. And last I checked, I believe this utility will give you the option to format either, or I guess what's most appropriate for the drive that you're trying to format, right? Um, yeah, it will. That's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Won't yet give you the ability to format as, um, Apple file system, but you know, we're getting there. All right. Yeah. So if I look here right now, so I'm in disutility on this machine, I'm not going to format my backup drive, but I'm clicking on my, uh, karma copy cloner backup and it says, Oh, you want to erase it? 
Uh, and then on the format list, it says Mac OS Extended, uh, several versions of Mac OS Extended, and then it lists EXFAT and MS-DOSFAT yep. as two other options. So yep. you can do it all with, all with the Mac. And I've been looking here for something that will modify extended attributes, and I can't really find anything. There used to be an app, uh, Cletus in the chat room helped us find, called Extra, E-X-T-T-R-A, but it doesn't seem like it's been updated in about five years. So you may have to do this from the command line. Um, that's it, not so bad because really you just need one command and we'll, we'll put a link in the show notes, uh, how to just wipe out all the extended attributes and, uh, and sort of reset them. But, uh, that's, that's where we're at. I thought I could have sworn there was a, um, there was a, a GUI that was kept up to date, but I don't think so. So anyway, it's the, uh, the dash C option. So it's X A. A T T R space dash C and that will wipe out and then the file name and that will wipe out all the extended attributes for that one. But I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for that. So, mm -hmm. so that took an unexpected turn, but um, useful info for anybody that has to deal with NTFS formatted stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. NTFS changes all those rules. Right. Right. Yeah. It's good stuff. Cool. All right, where are we here? Let's, um, um, well, I don't know. What do you want to go to, John? Pick one of our last four, and that's what we will do. Um, I'm kind of feeling like uh, like Jeff might be the one. Yeah, that that can get squirrely. So why not? Okay, let's, let's go. To All right, Jeff asks what seems to be a simple question. Maybe it has a simple answer. He says. Uh, my older MacBook Pro is getting a bit bloated and has been freezing intermittently, and I was thinking of wiping it clean and starting from scratch. My problem is that I have a number of applications that have turned to subscription models and don't make the prior versions easy to get. Is there a way to copy over selected applications and their supporting files? I was going to use Migration Assistant, but it looks like it might carry over more than I want. So it might, but migration assistant might still be the easiest answer. And you can, you can kind of, you can manage the cruft a little bit there. Um, but you could always just clone the drive so that you have a backup. Uh, and then try first, just if you want, just move over what's in the applications folder for each app that you want. Just manually in the finder, just go into the applications folder on your old drive on the clone, copy it over. My advice at this point would be copy it over, eject the clone so that it's not able to pull anything else from that drive and you're tr truly running from the new one and then run the app. For a lot of apps, this is going to work just fine. However, for some, it might not. And for those that don't, my first piece of advice would be to look in the home again, back on the old drive, uh, look in the home folder in library and in application support there. So home library application support, see what you might be able to find that appears related to this app that you have just tried to run and copy that over to the same location on the new drive. Then again, eject the clone and, and, and try again. I, I would think with, with both of those methods, you're probably going to get 95% of the stuff to work just fine. But I'm curious to your thoughts, John. Yeah, I was scratching my head over where, where uh, the only other place you may want to look to bring over some data, and yep. I've had to do this in the past, not, sure. not for a while, but um, preferences, things like activation keys or other things, maybe yeah. stored in the preferences folder. Now, that gets kind of interesting because there are multiple layers there. So you'll see if you look in the preferences, uh, typically library preferences, right? Uh, home, home, directory. home library preferences, but also root library preferences yeah i've seen them in both places yeah yeah there may be some important data again like an activation key or something like that stored in the preferences folder yep and if you look in the preferences folder you'll see i mean if you sort alphabetically most preferences there kind of announce who they belong to i mean right. you know, i'll see com.adobe dot whatever and com.apple and you know whoever the vendor is uh, there is a by host folder where sometimes things get put in there instead. And I'm not quite sure what actually it looks. Oh yeah, that's most, true. Almost actually it looks to be almost exclusively Apple stuff. So 
Hey, I do have another place, John. I always forget about this. And it's been long enough that I shouldn't. But I'm glad I remembered before we stopped recording. Um, home library containers. Remember, any apps that are sandboxed don't store their preferences in the normal places. They store them in the normal places inside their own container. So if you go to home library containers, you'll see uh, containers labeled by app in sort of the reverse domain order. So for mail, it would be, you know, com.apple.mail. Uh, for Pixelmator, it's, you know, com.pixelmator, team.pixelmator or whatever. Dig into there. Look in the data folder there. Then you'll see something that looks like your home folder. Um, look at the ones in here that are not aliases that don't have the little arrow on the folder. Usually that's just library. Sometimes it's library and documents. Um, the ones with aliases do point back to your normal, you know, desktop folder, movies, music, pictures, whatever that is. Uh, dig in library application support and you might find something in there. So that that's how the sandboxes are built. It's actually good. I highly recommend everybody go and do exactly the path we just discussed so that you can sort of see what, how these sandboxes are built and understand that the sandbox sometimes points back with shortcuts slash aliases to the root folders on your drive. And then sometimes just has stuff that's only accessible in its sandbox. It's a little convoluted, but it's worth digging in here when you're not in a pressure situation and you can just start to sort of grok with what, what, uh, what mm -hmm. Apple's doing here. So that's my, and, that's my advice. And if you want to get even more convoluted, so yeah. I've, I've had to do this in the past. So this is, I don't know if I call it cheating. No, sure. It's, 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 it's clever. If you want to find out all the places that an app puts things Maybe you should use an app cleaner. Oh, my that's interesting. Course, my oh, favorite, yeah. of course, being app cleaner. Right. <laughs> so that's the best free option. There are a number of vendors that make app cleaners, but to, uh, at least app cleaner. Let's see who who's that from here. That's uh, true. That'll free show Maxsoft. you. So yeah. app cleaner. What happens is that if you drag an application on top of App Cleaner, and typically what I do is I put an alias to it on my desktop. If you drag an application on top of it, it'll be like, okay, I see you're, you want to get rid of this. And I think you can automate the behavior too, but it's like, you, you can have it prompt you and say, all right, um, all right, here's the app. And then here's all the other places that I think it puts stuff. Yeah, don't delete it. Just note just, that list. Just look where, yeah. yeah, and it has, and sometimes it, yeah. And, That's good and, thinking, man. And and he the, the the author is pretty clever about digging and and finding all the the pieces uh, where they're scattered about, right? Including the folders that we talked about, but sometimes some unexpected uh, folders and some caches and var directories sometimes. And I'm like, huh, why is it putting stuff there? Well, yeah, who right. cares? But um, any of the app cleaners uh, were. Uh, were you can kind of do some detective work with them to see yeah. they, where, where they think all the all the pieces are. I like it, man. That's good stuff. Pretty cool, man. Nice find. Good show. Hey, uh, before we go, though, I want to make sure we send a shout out and a thanks to all of our premium subscribers. At uh, You can learn about premium at MacGeekab.com slash premium. But... Uh, I also want to extend our uh, specific thanks to those of you that either joined or renewed or contributed in some way this past week, as we have been doing. So starting with our uh, biannual and actually several of you had asked if uh, you, we had the option for you to set your own price for a one time donation. But for either the monthly or the every six to six month subscription, your prices were fixed. Some of you had asked if that could change and the answer is of course so i made that change this week so now you can choose how much you want to contribute every month or every six months uh by default it's 10 a month or 25 every six but you can um you know change those amounts when you set up your subscription and, and do whatever you like so uh absolutely happy to do that for you on the every six month plan and at 25 uh, each is uh we have two new subscribers doug a and ed t and then for renewals uh, this past week, Wayne B, Lou R, Scott R, and H. David S. Thank you to all six of you. You rock. 
On the monthly plan, we have three new subscribers. Two actually were new as of last month, but I screwed up and didn't note that. So, uh, W. Abdullah B., Doug L., and Michael B., all new. And then, renewing Channon K., David B., Michael L., Bob P., Jason A., Martin T., Dave C., Bob P., again, different Bob P., Frank A., Barry F., and Mark R., and then a one-time subscription uh, or a one-time contribution of five bucks from Brad J. Thank you to all of you. You all rock. All of you rock. Actually, you all rock, regardless of whether or not you're actively contributing on premium. We couldn't do the show without you. Those of you that uh, can and are willing to, uh, interested in and, and able to contribute premium, we really, really appreciate that. It all works together. And that's how it works. That's how it works. Uh, let's see. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com is the email address that you can send us anything you like. Questions, tips, cool stuff, found thoughts, requests. I don't know if I heard that, man. The band's getting out of control here. I, I thought you said feedback at MacGeekGab.com. I said feedback at MacGeekGab.com unless you're a premium listener, in which case premium at MacGeekGab.com is one of your perks. And we do address that first. So... It's all of that. Um, hey, uh, for those of you still listening and it's not yet Tuesday, if you're near Princeton, New Jersey, I am speaking in Princeton on Tuesday evening. Uh, we'll do another incarnation iteration of Mesh Wireless Talks, but uh, and then we go out for pizza afterwards. It's a blast. So I, if you're anywhere near Princeton, I highly recommend coming. It's always a good time. A great group, big group they've got there. So uh, P Mug NJ, I think is what they go by, but uh, but I would love to see you there. So if you can't come, or even if you can, you can always call us 224-888-GEEK, and John Geek is... 4335. That's what you think. And then you can find us on Facebook. Uh, go to MacGeekUp.com slash Facebook, as we said before. Great place to join our ever-growing community of awesome help and uh, camaraderie and all of that good stuff. I've been cleaning out my office lately and occasionally been posting in there about things I'm happy to give away to Mac Geek Cab listeners. And sometimes these things are, uh, you know, desirable. So it's not actually trash. It's just stuff I don't need anymore. So that's yet another reason to pay attention there. Of course, I want to make sure we thank our sponsors. And our sponsors for this episode include Smile from our PDF pen from Smile, of course. At smilesoftware.com slash geek, bitbucket.org slash for the code, barebones software at barebones.com, otherworld computing at macsales.com. So many great people supporting this show. You all rock. Thank you so much. <sighs> John, do you have anything pithy, concise, and relevant to share? Don't get caught. Made up.